Hi, I'm Lisa Friedman, a reform educator in central New Jersey, where I oversee an inclusive religious school. I've been training teachers in Madrahim for the past 12 years in how to meet the needs of diverse learners. If we want to have an inclusive culture in our schools, it needs to involve everyone. It's not just one person, it's not just the rabbi, it's not just an educator who says we're doing something a certain way. If in fact we want to be inclusive, we need to include in the conversation our teens who are going to be assistants in the classrooms, the teachers who are working in the school, the parents, the children, everybody needs to be a part of the conversation. And so I've been working specifically for many years with teens, with madrachim, helping them to understand that diverse learners have a place in the classroom and that they can go a long way in helping those diverse learners find success. In addition, trainings like this give teens the opportunity to understand their own learning styles in new and different ways and helps them to move forward as advocates for peers and students of all abilities. So the first activity that I did with the teens was to get them thinking about behavior. It was a conversation to think about the behaviors they might see in a classroom with students that they would work with or things that they might experience. And so we began with a categorization activity of what different behaviors are versus interpreting those behaviors. And then we moved into a conversation of emotions and understanding the different behaviors that um, children will really experience or may begin to experience based on different ways that they're feeling. One of the things that you can be doing when you're in a classroom with a teacher is that you can help that teacher notice some of the behaviors that are going on in the classroom. You can help some of the children in the classroom to be able to attend and to be able to participate in positive ways. And so now I want you to think about a classroom. Maybe you've been in, maybe you've worked in. I want you to think a little bit about the kinds of behaviors you've seen in those classrooms. Like in the past, like sometimes students are like playing with other stuff and like like drawing when they're just there looking at a book or something so they're distracted. So the behavior that you've seen is drawing. Distraction or distracted is your interpretation of it. But you've seen students draw. You've seen, right? Yeah. You've seen students play with toys. Yeah. Fair. We could interpret these things in a lot of different ways. Just knowing that a child or that a person is laughing, there are a lot of different reasons why that child or that person could be laughing, right? It could be positive. It could be negative. I didn't ask you to differentiate between the two. I just asked you for behaviors, for what you could see. Now we're going to take it to the next place. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to put out another group of cards. These have words on them this time. This time you're reading instead of looking at pictures. I'm going to put out another group of cards. You're going to take a look at the words. This is personal now. Let's see if I can find mine. This is mine. Everybody see this word? Yes? Everybody see what it says? We're good? Okay. My word is hungry. And here is when it's my turn to share with all of you. I'm going to say, I'm Lisa. And when I'm hungry, I snap at people. You're choosing a word. You're bringing it back to your space. And you're coming up with a sentence about that word that tells us who you are. And when you feel or experience said word, you do what? We're going to go around. Everybody's going to do theirs. I'm going to do mine again to set us all off. My name's Lisa, and when I'm hungry, I snap at people. I'm Rachel, and when I'm happy, uh, everyone else around me is happy too. <laughs> that was a really, we're going to come back to this one. That was really interesting, by the way. So, we just took behaviors and brought them back around to emotions, right? We sort of did it back door, 
You may not have even realized we were doing it, but we sort of took these kinds of things. We took behaviors and brought them around the other, the other way. Who's the doodler? Yeah. Right? So if I walk into a classroom and I see you doodling, I might be able to interpret, I might be able to interpret that you're bored. But what else might happen? I'm the teacher and you're drawing. What else might my interpretation be? What else could I assume? Dangerous, but what else could I assume about you, my student? That you're not listening. Great. What else could I assume? I'm the teacher. He's drawing. What else could I assume? Right, that he doesn't care, that he's not listening, that he's chewed it all out, that he's being disrespectful. A lot of assumptions that we can make. Assumptions are really dangerous. It's a lot better, it's a lot better when we can start to unpack these emotions. Here's the thing. You are going to work with children much smaller than yourselves who can't do what we just did the same way. It's your job to really be a detective and to really not make assumptions. There are a lot of things that kids could be doing, but there are a lot of emotions that could go along with it. And here's what's also really interesting, aside from mine, there's some really hard ones left on the table. Singled out, embarrassed, judged, excluded, hurt, angry, these are the emotions you guys left behind. You might even be struggling at your age, I struggle at mine, to explain what I do when I feel this way. There are a lot of assumptions we can make based on that list up there. But until we say, or we have a conversation with the kids to find out how they're feeling, we can't begin to know why they're acting that way. If I walk into a classroom and Alex is doodling and I immediately say, pay attention, I've missed something. I've missed an opportunity to understand that Alex might be listening better because he's doodling. I've missed an opportunity to bond with Alex get to know him, and get to recognize that he's a pretty darn awesome artist. Behavior is communication. The kids are trying to tell you and the teachers something with every single thing that they do. So one of the first activities that we did as faculty and Madrachim together was a text study activity. And the first reason, of course, is that everything we do is grounded in Jewish text. And so that is a great way of framing what we are talking about. But we also set it up to begin to frame the conversation about inclusion. And so we gave them text, but what we were really doing was making sure that the activity itself was deliberately vague so that when we processed the activity at the end, we could really begin to elicit some of the challenges of students in different kinds of learning situations. So now we're going to transition a little bit and we're going to put the conversation out there that we, that we told you was going to be a part of tonight's conversation. And that's a conversation about inclusivity, about inclusion, and about working with children who have specific learning needs. You may have students in your classes and you may have students here in the school that you will either get to know, work with one-on-one, -on -one, or work with across the different grades that have a variety of abilities and a variety of challenges. And so we're going to talk a little bit about why it's important as a community to be aware of those challenges and what it is that we as a community can do to support people and support children in this case in particular who have various challenges in classroom spaces. I'm going to put you in groups. The best that we can, we're going to have a teacher and a couple of madrachim together in a group. And I'm going to give you a poster board. I'm going to give you some stickers. On the stickers is some Jewish text. We're going to have a conversation about inclusion, what it means, why it matters, why you think it matters, why you think I'm even standing here talking about it. Why do you think I'm saying inclusion so many times? <laughs> You're going to take the stickers. 
You're going to arrange them on the poster board, however you think they belong. I liked it. Okay. I, I, I thought I, I saw similarities. I saw groups already. Formed. Okay, so it's you really concepts. immediately this this spoke to you and the way that your brain worked, and you said, "Great, I'm going categories. I'm all over it. Here, 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 and here." It was yes, yeah. fantastic. Anybody else? Immediately, they saw this. They were like, "Okay, I got it." Okay, but, yeah. <laughs> why? No, more like we thought that originally that when we put it on that they would be arranged in a certain way or order, and then when we looked at them, they, we really couldn't separate them into categories. That they really were all related. Okay. Whether they were about how God um, created us or what our purpose is or how children should learn that they were really all, the only way to do it was to just have it in a big circle without okay. differentiation. Is that the point at which you called me over and wanted some help? Or was that... Yeah, really... I didn't really get so much help though. No, <laughs> no, not really. Anybody else feel that kind of frustration? I heard confused. Who was confused? Some of them didn't really like go together as much as I thought they would. Okay. So that was a little frustrating. Yeah. Okay. Would but you have liked some more guidance? We made it work. Yeah. You made it work. We made it work. Great. The activity of learning styles or beginning to understand learning styles is one in which we put the learners in a situation to begin to understand that we all learn in different ways. And they participated in a brief but powerful exercise that helped them quickly to understand that each of them comes at their learning in a different way. So now we're going to talk a little bit about learning styles. We sort of began to touch on that a little bit, right? That each of us learns in a certain way. Using a non-dominant hand, you're going to write your name on the bottom left corner of a piece of paper. And then you're going to write the following number from memory. Everybody see it? Great. You got 30 seconds. Go. <laughs> oh, do you need to see it again? All right. All right. We have to write the number. Hang on. Let's go back. Using your non-dominant hand. You're going to write your name, your name, on the bottom left corner of the paper. And you're going to write the following number from memory. This is the number that you're going to write. You only get 30 seconds, so starting now, go. them with numbers? No. I, I, no. Words. Words. How many of you second time around wrote numbers? Raise your hand. But only for 1948. So it wasn't because it was a number, but because I knew, I, I thought of Israeli independence as 1948. Okay. I don't know why I thought Israeli independence because I guess it could have been any independence <laughs> now that I think about it. I only did it for 911. Okay. Did this annoy you? Yeah. Why? I hear you lots of why. Really. 
All right, let's hear the yeses and then let's hear the not reallys. A couple of yeses. Why did it annoy you? Because I didn't pick up any correlation between the non-dominant activity and the dominant activity. Oh, so the whole non-dominant hand thing, I just threw that out and left from left field and it made no sense to you whatsoever. Yeah, but I also didn't like get the correlation between writing down the number and then thinking of like, the first thing you thought of. Okay. Anybody else that was annoyed, that was frustrated, tell me why. Well, it was only frustrating at the first one that, first of all, I'm right left-handed, so when you said non-dominant and you said write it in the left corner, it didn't matter what you said. I still wrote my name in the right corner because it was closest to where my hand was. Right. So it, I wasn't doing it. And then I thought, well, there you go. You see, I have no memory. Because I right. could only remember the first corner. <laughs> right. So then you write. So there was... I heard some stupid down the end there, but same thing, right? Immediately beating yourself up. Immediately thinking about what you're doing wrong in this activity. I must be wrong because, great, not great that you felt that way, <laughs> great that these are some of the reactions that we're having to some of this. So how many of you saw numbers and went, done? But as soon as you saw pictures, you were like, all right, I'm good. How many of you had the opposite reaction? How many of you saw the numbers? You were like, all right, numbers. i got to memorize it. I'm good. And then later I showed you pictures, and you were like, really? <laughs> pictures. No two minds think alike. Everybody benefits from a way that I'm being taught in a way that embraces our needs, known as differentiating instruction. It's a buzzword. It's a huge buzzword in education right now. This concept of differentiated instruction is one that talks to us about figuring out students' strengths and capitalizing on them in a way that makes it make sense to them to help them absorb the learning. For the next activity, Madrochim had the opportunity to work in Chavruta to experience reading in a way that might not be the traditional way to experience reading or to begin to even understand more deeply some of the challenges that those who have reading and learning disabilities may experience. You're going to move again. You're going to go in a group again. Teenagers, you are not going to go with the first partner you had for the opening activity and you are not going to go back to the group that you just worked with on the text poster. So you're going to mix it up yet again. Everybody needs a partner. That's it, just two. If we're uneven, we'll make another three. Everybody needs a partner, so please try to work with somebody you haven't worked with yet. And you're going to do you're going to do a reading activity together. The question that I always find the question that I always find the most significant is how would you feel of all of your reading material, of all of your schoolwork, how would you feel if everything you looked at looked like version one? Frustrated to the point where I probably lose a lot of the motivation to do the schoolwork. Okay. I mean, after a while, I'd probably get used to it. So you think you might come up with ways to compensate? You kind of have to. Okay. Probably feel stupid. Maybe. Makes me sad, but you're probably right. But I feel like if you knew that this wasn't what it was supposed to look like to you, and you figured out a way to say, like, hey, I can't read this like I should be, and if you figured out that you were dyslexic or had some other thing that could be dealt with, that then it would be okay, but otherwise I'd just be really confused. So having to look at all of your reading material with no explanation for why it looks like gibberish, really hard, really frustrating. But we're hearing, or Jackie is saying, that maybe at least if I knew what this was called or why this was happening to me, I could get somewhere with it. Maybe there'd be some strategies, maybe there'd be some way, or even, like Evan was suggesting, maybe I could even figure out how to compensate. Definition of fairness is that each person gets what he or she needs in order to be successful. Okay, so we're going to just circle back around to this because we touched on a couple of pieces from this earlier, and we're going to come back around and sort of tie up some of the loose ends that have been hanging out there, and then I'm going to answer some questions if you have them. We started with a conversation about behavior being communication, everything that a child, a person, anything that we do in this life is 
communication. We're trying to communicate something. Our jobs, our role as Metro team, as teachers, as people, is to figure out what somebody's trying to tell us. We also talked a little bit about not taking behaviors personally. That children, we now know there's lots of reasons why kids could be frustrated in a classroom. By the way, there could be 13,000 things that happened to them before they got to that classroom that could be why they're acting a certain way. You still have the responsibility to know the child, to understand the child, to be in relationship with the child, to recognize that what he or she is not saying with their mouth is still communication. There are things that you just can't be responsible for carrying around. If, it's, if somebody says something to you that makes you uncomfortable, you have to tell an adult. You either have to tell the teacher in the classroom or you have to tell Janice. You do not need to be responsible to know whether or not that's true. You need to know enough to take that to an adult. No. Right? Know when you need help. Know when you're over your head. Don't ever, don't ever, ever, ever feel like you don't have adults that you can ask questions of. And if the kids reveal something personal to you that makes you a little uncomfortable, go with that. Assume that that is uncomfortable for a reason and take it to an adult. You guys will definitely be an additional set of eyes. You will see things that the teacher might miss. You will see things that the teacher just hasn't seen yet because you have a different vantage point. You just have a different vantage point. And there's a reason why we want you in these classrooms with our children, right? There was a reason why you are valuable. There are a lot of reasons why you're valuable. That's one of them. The fact that you have this vantage point that you might catch something, notice something, recognize something before the teacher even does. And the last one is model appropriate behavior yourself.